Greetings and welcome back to 303 and our lectures on the Harvard Classics in Volume 2. I now turn to the third, actually, of the dialogues of Plato that constitute what scholars have often referred to as the final days of Socrates. In an earlier lecture, we already talked on the Apology, which is the first of those actually in the second volume of the Harvard Classics. Uh, however, there's a, it's actually four uh, dialogues by Plato. We mentioned already the Euthyphro, which is that series of comments that are made in the courtroom, outside the courtroom, talking right before Socrates will go on trial in front of his antagonizers, Miletus and the rest of those cats, who are going to ultimately condemn Socrates to his final fate. That is to say, they will find him guilty of, remember two things for your notes, one, Socrates the old man is guilty of being an atheist, and two, he's guilty, seems like these always go together, of ruining the youth, that is to say, corrupting their minds in some way, teaching them how to ask questions that sometimes don't have simple answers. At the conclusion of Apology, it's clear then that Socrates has given his defense but that his defense has not worked. Now there's a, there's a real argument, and we'll get to it obviously in our study of the Crito as well, that maybe Socrates has what Freud called a death wish. That is to say, he knows that he's going to get taken down, and he wants to get taken down. We'll get into it in more detail now in this third of the four lectures, just to remind Euthyphro number one, Apology number two, that's the defense of, of Socrates in front of the Athenian uh, Athenians who will condemn him. Now to the Crito, and that's the one we'll be playing the game with now. Final culminating with the Phaedo. That's our next lecture, and we'll be talking about the last words of Socrates right before he drinks the hemlock, the poison, that will finally execute him. Socrates is asked some questions, most notably, dude, you're about to die. You don't seem too worried about that. Now, of course, uh, the fact is he's not worried about that. I mean, at the conclusion of Apology, he said it out loud. The unexamined life is not worth living. It's fine if you want to condemn me. A good man never has to fear of dying or death. We're going to see this mantra kind of played out again with this uh, text, Crito. Let's say three things about the text in over overall before we get into the actual level one discussions. Um, we should point out that while Euthyphro is a true dialogue, that is to say a back and forth exchange between Socrates and an interlocutor, as we used that term earlier, interlocute to locute to speak, somebody that you're exchanging ideas with, Euthyphro definitely is that, an exchange between Socrates and this guy who's standing outside the court who is in fact about to go on trial himself because he's going to bring his father on trial, actually, a son bringing his father on trial. That's Euthyphro. Apology, however, technically we have a hard time defining it as a, as a dialogue. I mean, with the exception of that little exchange between Socrates and Miletus, there's not a lot of back and forth. Socrates is just kind of basically giving his defense. This is why I live the kind of life I lived. However, Crito, and this is why we want to study it, Crito is a classic example of the Platonic dialogue, where we have two speakers. One Socrates, the other Crito. Although we'll point out that technically there are three speakers because Socrates will play a game in this dialogue of taking on the persona or the voice of the state, the Athenian state. He'll actually speak for the city of Athens, if you will, and he'll make observations as if somehow the state could speak, making this a, an, an, a kind of an intriguing dialogue on a number of counts that we'll get into. As we study then Crito, we want to look at it as a short dialogue, but a remarkably powerful dialogue. I mean, it's going to raise some really profound questions for us, like, for example, what about the state and the role of the state and the responsibility of individuals within the state to take care of the state? We'll get into this discussion here. For example, if we were to ask you to write on the whiteboard, for example, the two words, the state or the government, and an individual. What kind of a sign would you put in between in that mathematics sign of greater than, lesser than, equal to? That question is one of the penultimate questions of Western philosophy. Which is more important, 
your life as an individual or your life as a citizen within the group, the state, the government. Okay? And when friction begins to occur between those two things, which one is more important? You, the individual, or the state made up of collections of individuals? And, of course, by extension, let's put it in our notes already because we're going to get there. The state is, of course, only as good as its laws. That is to say, what are the rules that the state will create? Laws. And then, how seriously committed should the state be to enforcing those laws? And, what happens when an individual, here we'll think Socrates, has been condemned by the state, we think Athens, but is now in a situation where he possibly could escape his punishment? That's exactly what's going to happen in Crito. Let's give the overarching uh, story really fast at level one, just so you understand. Because the question's going to be, is it ever okay to disobey the state or the government? Is it ever okay to break the law? If, for example, you're raised to say, I have to keep the law because that's important, but what happens if you decide you will break the law but for morally legitimate reasons? Of course, we've got a number of titles that immediately jump to mind that we've already studied together. Sophocles' Antigone will come to mind almost immediately, and we'll mention it later at 3A. Let's give the overview. It's a simple dialogue in this regards. Crito will come to Socrates' cell. He will say to Socrates, I have money. You don't, because you don't obviously expect money in your teaching, but I have money. I have taken care of everything. We have an exit plan. It is simple. You literally are going to get up and you're going to walk out of this cell and you're going to leave this prison and we're going to get you out of Athens. Done. You don't have to drink the hemlock in two days. Easy. Socrates will have already been in prison for about a month. There's this strange thing that goes on back during the time when a ship has to return back to Athens and they've been waiting on this ship to come, and for reasons that we won't get into, the ship hasn't arrived. And so Socrates didn't go right from his condemnation at the end of Apology, the dialogue, right into the prison, drink his hemlock poison, and die. Instead, there's been about a month that he's been waiting in prison, and now the time has come. We're a couple of days away from the taking of the poison. When Crito shows up in the early morning hours, and he says to Socrates, let's go. We got, it. We got you out of here. And Socrates says to Crito, well, let's think about that. And Crito goes, no, 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 you don't get it. We, we, don't have a, we don't have a huge window of time. Let's go, let's go, let's go. i got to get you out of prison. And Socrates is like, I think we better think about this. Because before we act, remember his line from the Apology, the unexamined life is not worth living. A life of spiritual, intellectual intentionality is necessary to living the good life. So before Socrates is going to commit any act... He's going to ask, why? Well, what is the act Crito is asking him to commit? Walk out of prison. Socrates' answer, well, wait. Let's sit down and have a conversation. And you get this sense that Crito immediately is like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not interested in no conversation. Let's get you out of here. And Socrates is like, no, no, no. I think this is a pivotal learning moment. Because why am I in prison? Well, the city of Athens found you guilty. So that means if I'm walking out of this prison, I'm going to break the law. And Crito's like, well, well, well yeah, I mean, you know, of a kind, but I mean, you, I mean, it's, it's, it, you, you're not guilty, and you were found guilty. In other words, you're innocent. Wait, wait, wait. I was innocent, but I was found guilty by the state, and the state makes the laws. Do I not have an obligation to the state? If I walk out of here, then I am a lawbreaker. And that means their accusations about me were actually founded because for the first time in my life I will have broken the law. The argument that he makes then is going to be a very difficult and thorny argument. Of course, I know that 3A already, you're writing down, this is going to sound very similar to the questions of a Martin Luther King Jr., for example, who is going to practice nonviolent resistance, or to, for example, a Henry David Thoreau in his classic essay, Civil Disobedience. The question is obvious. At what point ever, if ever, does an individual have the right to go against the will of the state? 
And on what grounds should that happen? And of course, we think about any number of writers. Solzhenitsyn comes to mind. I mean, we think about a lot of writers in the history of Western thought who, is, who are going to raise this same question for us. And it's raised beautifully in this little brief dialogue where Crito says, fine, sits down with Socrates, and Socrates says, now, let me ask you a few questions. We're going to be introduced to the Socratic method the Socratic method, where Socrates will ask questions, and he waits for an answer, and then he comes back with another question. And this can, of course, become deeply troubling for Crito, because he already begins, he's, he's a bright student, a bright student, and so he already begins to kind of get the sense of where the questions, the line of question is going, and he wants to argue against it, but he can't. And he realizes by the end of the dialogue, let's go ahead and say it out loud, by the end of the dialogue, guess what? Socrates is going to have Crito agree with him, we have to stay here. As much as it pains me to say it, I have to stay here, I have to let the state execute me, and two days from now I'm going to drink the hemlock and I will be gone. Do I like it? No. But it's necessary that I follow the law even if I disagree with the law. We'll of course get into the real weeds of all of this. Let's turn now to the uh, dialogue itself. And as we open the dialogue, and of course, you don't have to have a Harvard's Classic to be able to study along with me. All you have to do is find the dialogue online, or of course, go to any book that would have this dialogue, and it's useful for you to be following online with me, uh, 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 following along with the, uh, with the text itself. We're going to now turn. He arrives in the early morning. Right away, Socrates points out, Socrates is sleepy. Crito can't believe it. You're two days away from, from dying, and you're sleeping like a baby. I mean, look at you. To which Socrates' answer is, why would I be sleeping? Because you're going to die? Well, yeah, but I'm a 70-year-old I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man, one, which means I'm old. I mean, what, you met any 200-year-old people walking around lately? You, you had to know from the time you were born you were going to die. What's there to fear? And secondly, the argument that he'll make is well in Phaedo, as here. If you've lived a good life, you have no reason to fear death. Death is only feared by people who have lived a poor life. We think of, of course, Scrooge at the end of the Christmas Carol, right? Just give me one more day. If you've lived a good life, what's the problem? I, I, I got no issues. By the way, just as an aside, we should point out that this reminds us in some ways, for those of us, of course, who are readers of the New Testament, that there's this wonderful story about Christ being on a boat in the middle of a terrible storm, and while everybody else is worried desperately about their life, He's sleeping. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting way to point out, what are you worried about? It's all going to be fine. And of course, in that story, the ability to calm a storm is proof one more time of, uh, of Christ's ability to even conquer nature. Here, of course, Socrates' ability to conquer uh, anxiety through sleep is kind of a turnaround on that one. And he says, I'm not worried about it at all. Of course, um, uh, we, we get it right away from Crito. Quote, I come to bring you a message which is sad and painful, not as I believe to yourself, but to all of us who are your friends, and saddest of all, to me. It simply says, the ship has arrived from Dios, and it's time for you to get ready to drink the hemlock. <sighs> the pressure is now on. But, good news, I have a way for you to get out of this place. Let's go. We have an exit strategy. We have a plan. I have money, I have friends who are going to have expected of me that I get you out of here, so that's exactly what we're doing. Now, of course, in a normal world, a person would just say, whoa, I get to escape? Awesome, let's go. Out we go. No, no, not Socrates. And this is what makes him, of course, the classic philosophic teacher. He is, of course, ready to say, hmm. Crito will say, my beloved Socrates, let me entreat you once more to take my advice and escape. He says, if you don't do this, there's any number of problems. For if you die, I shall not only lose a friend who can never be replaced, but there's another evil. People who do not know you and me will believe that I might have saved you if I had been willing to give money, but that I did not care. In other words, he says, I'm kind of worried that later on, people are going to say, you were a friend of Socrates, right? Yes, I was. And you have a lot of money. Yes, I do. And you didn't, like, do anything to help him get out of prison? Uh, okay, well, here's the thing, he says to Socrates. I have, I have to get you out. 
My reputation is at stake here, just like your life is at stake here. And oh yeah, by the way, you're a close pal of mine. And close pals do good things for close pals. In other words, let's go. Notice he says, Now, can there be a worse disgrace than this, that I should be thought to value money more than the life of a friend? For the many will not be persuaded that I wanted you to escape and that you refused. Socrates' response, predictable in every way. Here he comes. But why, he asks. And again, here's the dialogue. A back and forth. A back and forth. But why, my dear Crito, should we care about the opinion of the many? Good men, and they are the only persons who are worth considering, will think of these things truly as they happen. Now, of course, this is powerful stuff if you're reading this dialogue because you are one of these people who is challenged. And Plato will talk about this at 2B in his dialogues. He has this amazing genius ability to kind of reach out of his page and to say, hey, 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 you need to come in and listen to this one. And, of course, you're almost like a voyeur. You're watching this dialogue as it takes place. You can easily see, if you are a reader of the Euthyphro and Apology, that Socrates is in the right. He's not, he's not a bad guy. He's a good guy. He is innocent of the charges of atheism and, of course, corruption of the youth, but he's been found guilty. So now we are on the horns of a nasty, nasty dilemma. If you are innocent but have been found guilty by the state on trumped-up charges and you are asked to drink hemlock as your form of execution, and a pal of yours comes to you and says, let's go. What do you do? Do you accept the plan of escape? Or do you rather say what Socrates will say, let's think about it. Now, of course, in the process of thinking about it, we are going to enjoin some really interesting kind of philosophic questions. Before we get there, though, just for your notes, let's make sure we understand what Crito's argument is. Before we get to Socrates' argument, let's make sure we understand Crito's argument. Crito's argument is really fourfold. One, he says, <laughs> I'm your pal and I'm going to lose you as a pal. I don't want you to die. Let's go. Two, by staying, think about this, we let the bad guys win. These were trumped up charges, this whole thing about you being an atheist and ruining the state. And if you, if you drink the hemlock here in two days, your, your enemies win. And that's a terrible thing when the enemies win. Ugh. Number three, this is an interesting one. And it's one that's a little bit, it's, got, it's always raised questions because he mentioned it in an apology and now he's going to mention it again. Yeah, you have children. Wait a minute, how old is Socrates? Seventy. You have children. Oh, you mean like adults who have gone, no, no, no. We are told that Socrates has young children. I mean, I'll let you figure that one out on your own. But the 70-year-old Socrates, maybe it's a way for Plato to just kind of show just how unbelievably energetic and virile the, the old man really was. In other words, it's funny. Socrates is always wanting to talk about how old he is, and yet he's got kids. And Crito's like, really? You're going to die and leave your kids? Now, of course, for those of us who have studied our Arthur Miller's play, Crucible, we know all about this dilemma. Right? John Proctor at the end of the play, remember, he's got to decide, if I don't sign this document that's a kid, oh wait, Miller clearly playing the game of Crito. Right, John Proctor is innocent. He has been accused by the state of trumped up charges. What does he do? He has the opportunity to escape. All he's got to do is lie and sign some stupid piece of paper. Of course, in the process of doing it, remember, John Proctor will claim, it's my reputation that's at stake. <sighs> How can I ever raise my children if I were to escape? Here, though, Crito, it's the reverse argument. Are you really going to leave your kids? I mean, you're their dad. You're going to escape, and you're going to raise your sons. Come on, let's go. The fourth one is this one about Crito's reputation that we were just mentioning a second ago. And of course, it's kind of ironic. Crito seems a little bit, maybe we would say, selfish to say, okay, 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 you know, look, you're, you're going to make me look bad here if you end up getting jacked because all my pals know I got money and I can get you out of here. So I need you to escape so I can look, okay, like I was the one that did it. Hurrah for me. Socrates' response is an interesting one. Let's go ahead and say in our notes, and Platonist scholars have argued about this, is it a response or is it not a response? Let's go ahead and say it out loud. Three of the four, he doesn't really respond much to at all. He kind of says it, uh, you know, it's not that big of a deal. 
Um, but he does have a thing or two to say uh, about uh, the, the, uh, the, the final argument, and so that's where we're gonna, that's where we're gonna spend most of our time. Socrates will say, um, but still I find with surprise that the old argument is, as I conceive, unshaken as ever. And I should like to know whether I may say the same of another proposition, that not life, but a good life, is to be chiefly valued. So let's go ahead and put it in our notes right away. The argument that he's going to make is, it isn't about living your life. It's about living a good life. And Socrates is very much focused on ending your life well. Don't waste the opportunity of a good death, in other words, we might say. Now, for those of you that know anything about some certain kinds of movies that may be watched, that kind of thing, uh, you are maybe familiar with this idea, this philosophic idea, that you can live a remarkable life, but if you don't end it well, it is the final moment of your life that will matter. And Socrates says, I'm not going to have lived this remarkable philosophic life outlined again in the Apology so well, and then come to the end of my life and all of a sudden turn tail and run? One of the things we can put on our notes is that, of course, this idea, you can either argue your philosophy, your theology, your life code, whatever you want to call it, or you can actually live it. And he says, I mean, are you serious with me? I would like walk around teaching about how you shouldn't fear death, and then at the moment that I'm going to be executed, I run? No, he says, I can't, I can't abide that idea. He continues by, uh, by saying, I'm clearly right, um, uh, and I'll, and I'll, uh, I, I, um, he says, the, the other considerations which you mentioned of money and loss of character and the duty of educating children are, as I hear, only the doctrines of the multitude. Now, there's some real argument here about um, does he have an obligation to his children to educate his children? And is this kind of hard-hearted on Socrates' po uh, you know, point? We'll come back to this when we study Phaedo together, that at the very end, when Socrates is ready to drink his hemlock poison, his wife and children are brought into him, and of course they all start crying because he's about to die, and his one comment will be, I